Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Appreciate it. Faculty, thank you all for the uh, invitation. Do you guys go by Chestertonians? Would I call you? Would I call you that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it rolls off the tongue pretty well, I think. But no, it's great to be with you guys, and uh, we have about what a half hour or so, right? Okay. So I'll kind of give a couple overview things on more of the spirituality of confession. I think you guys have learned some of the more the theological aspects of it. So I wanted to give more of something that you can kind of take to your prayer more, right? So we'll go over some of that, and then I do want to try to leave some time for, for questions so we can talk about a few different things. So the first thing with, with confession is you have to situate it properly in, in where it belongs. So it is a sacrament that belongs to when baptism, essentially, when you lose baptismal grace. So we always have to keep confession kind of related to baptism. So what is, what is baptism? Baptism is the you know, remission of original sin and justification. So justification is kind of where I want to begin because it helps kind of root us in the spirituality that we're supposed to have. So the Council of Trent, the decree on justification, gives us two very important things to remember about not just justification, but then also the forgiveness of sins in the sacrament of confession. Justification... I'm trying to quote directly, but it may be a paraphrase. Justification is not only about the forgiveness of sins, but also about the renewal of the inner man. Okay? Did you guys catch that? You follow me? Confession is not just about the forgiveness of sins. Justification in general is not just about the forgiveness of sins. It is about the renewal of your souls, of my soul. Okay? Now, why is that important? It's important because, number one, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, so it has to be important, okay? But the other reason is because with concupiscence and with our experience of confession, it is a very easy temptation to make confession, as weird as this will sound, this is going to sound weird, to make confession too much about the sins. You understand what I'm saying? to make it too much about what's going on in your head about your sins. We certainly need to bring sins to confession, as you've learned in your classes. But what is really happening in that sacrament is that you are being transformed. You are being renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Which is a much different thing than sort of sitting in your own mind and in your own thoughts about how sin defines you, which it does not. Remember from baptism, the only identity you receive from baptism is that you are a child of God, okay? Anything to the contrary, aka sin, okay? Anything to the contrary of that identity is a privation of that identity. It's not real, okay? So when we go to confession, we have to keep that context. It's very important because that's going to lead us to a healthier experience of what God is actually doing in our life. So what this would come down to, practically, it's really a very important thing for all aspects of your thinking, all aspects of your daily life, is how can you make your life more Christocentric? You guys know what I mean by that word? Christocentric. The, the temptation of thinking about your sins too much, especially in context of the spirituality of confession, is that confession is about Christ. You follow me? Confession is about the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ and how you enter into that. But it's about Him primarily. Okay? It's about the prodigal son returning to the father's house. The prodigal sons, the prodigal daughters. Okay? So, a proper spirituality might be summed up in a sacred heart devotion. That type of, that type of spirituality where it's Christ's heart that is moving your heart. I heard a story one time about, actually it wasn't a story, it was at a conference, like a, a tutorial about how to minister to women and men who have uh, gone through the sin of abortion. Okay, So very dark stuff, very, very painful. And we were discussing, I was with a number of priests, and we were discussing how to give penance to a woman who or a man who has confessed this sin. 
And, you know, there's a few different theories. Oh, well, you want it to be something that, uh, you know, is substantial maybe, right? You know, or we should, you know, say the rosary every day for the next month or something like that. Try to give something substantial. And one of the, one of the ladies who was one of the facilitators at these, at these meetings said, you want, obviously, you have to give a penance, right? That's required in the sacrament. But he said, that woman has probably been thinking about doing this for 20, 30 years to come to this moment, to actually enter that confessional. She's come with a broken heart, and she's given that heart to God, to Christ, in the confessional. So basically what she was saying is the penance should be keep giving your heart to Christ. That was, in some sense, a spirituality that she captured there. That in, that, in the confessional, when we are approaching it, we cannot form in our minds this kind of transactional relationship with God. It cannot be, I have done X, Y, and Z. It's, everyone tells me at school I'm supposed to go tell the priest that I did X, Y, and Z. And then I go and I say my prayers and then I go on with my life. That is certainly true, that that is what's happening. There's a human dimension to this, right? But the deeper thing that is happening is that you are entering into the life of God, okay? You're entering into the Paschal Mystery. You're entering into the Sacred Heart of Christ. And it's not just about the forgiveness of sins, but the renewal of the inner man. You see how that connects? You are being renewed in some sense, as you go through the trials and tribulations of sin, God is revealing Himself to you in the midst of that. In some respects, we are not going to escape sin. It's part of us, right? It's part of our experience. We're beat up by it. We're scarred by it. But that's where the healing remedy of God comes in. Okay? I want to read from Luke 7 very briefly, because this will move us into, that's kind of the a first kind of reflection of how you enter the sacrament, okay? And the spirituality you bring with you, bring to the sacrament. But now there comes this interesting thing. St. Teresa of Avila talks about this a little bit from the scriptures, and I'll read it in here in a second, the whole thing. But he who sins much loves much. So does that mean you have to sin to learn how to love God? It seems confusing. He who sins much loves much. But let's read this, and then we'll, we'll keep talking about that. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Dost thou, this is Christ talking, and turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Dost thou see this woman? I came into thy house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with tears, and has wiped them with her hair. Thou gavest me no kiss, but she, from the moment she entered, has not ceased to kiss my feet. Thou did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say to thee, her sins, many as they are, shall be forgiven her, because she has loved much. But he to whom little is forgiven loves little. And he said to her, thy sins are forgiven. And they who were at table with him began to say within themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. So, it brings up an interesting conundrum for us. In some respects, Jesus is saying here, because she has sinned, she has this ability to love greater. Okay. So, I don't know how you would follow this in your logic class, but it would seem, okay, so therefore, if I sin more, I will love more. That is not, <laughs> that's not what it's saying here. What it's saying is that in our weakness, in our damaged lives, in our brokenness, this is where God actually enters and loves you. You understand? loves you in that sin, in that brokenness. Once He loves you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are renewed. You are changed. 
Okay? Now, the way you're supposed to love God is through contemplation. Okay? That is when God loves you, it draws you into that and pulls you away from sin. I'm sure you guys have studied this. Remember, as you get closer, to, it's not that you have to leave sin first, remember, and then go to God, right? It's God enters into your life and then gives you an aversion to sin. Remember? I'm sure you've studied this. God calls you to Himself in God's love for you. You are then averted to sin. You've been renewed and you are averted to sin. That's why the Council of Trent was so critical on saying that these two things have to be held in distinction, essentially. We have to understand that there's two things happening. Forgiveness, but also renewal. Okay? So what this ultimately ends up doing for us, and I'll close with this for this uh, kind of opening reflection on spirituality. When we enter into this place of brokenness, this place of sin, we are forced to recognize the reality about ourselves. Okay? This is, in some ways, preparing to go to confession is really a living in reality of what's actually going on in your own life and how that has related to the glory, the glory of God and the love of neighbor. To the extent that you have not loved God and loved neighbor, you have not lived in reality because God is only two things in Scripture, being and love. I am who am, St. John, God is love. Okay? So to the extent you do not love, you are not. You follow me? To the extent you don't love God and love neighbor, you are acting out of not a privation of being. So therefore, you are denying reality. So preparing for confession is really a simple recognition of what is real. What is real about you, what is real about your actions, your lack of actions. Because we want to live in reality because in reality, we discover the love of God because it's the only real thing. See how this kind of connects? I didn't put it into a whole certain, you know, it's not, uh, I don't have it laid out super clean in like a lecture style here, but I hope you're seeing how these things kind of work together, okay? Um, maybe I'll write a little pamphlet one day or something, you know, and put all my thoughts down. But um, so when you live in reality, it produces humility, it's kind of the final thing. When you live in the truth of who you are in relation to God, which God is enlightening you through the grace of the Holy Spirit to know these things, right? As that's happening, you are moved towards Him in humility because you recognize that you do not have being without Him. You do not have peace without Him. And you don't have the deepest longings of the human heart, love, without Him. So allow yourself to be moved in your heart towards the sacred heart. Dispose yourself to know who you really are before God and allow His grace to move you. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you for your kind attention.